uh, engaged in praising the Lord as we express our love for the Savior and these lovely words, my Jesus, I love thee, I do thee all the time. And then we will express our heart's thankfulness as we sing, my heart is filled with thankfulness. Thank you.
in the visit of John and Mary Brew. The young man John worshipped with us here and uh, he has served the Lord along with his wife so faithfully for many years in Peru with our Baptist missions. And this will be our la his last visit as uh, a member of the Baptist mission staff. They hope to go back to Peru where they will retire. And so it's an opportunity for us to meet up with John and Lourdes again and to enjoy fellowship with them and to say cheerio to them in the will of the Lord. So do keep that in mind and make that effort to be out, please, on Wednesday evening at half seven. Ladies' night is Thursday at half past seven. Ladies, keep that evening in mind. And Audrey and Victor Maxwell will be interviewed and they'll be sharing their story of God's leading and guidance and blessing in their lives. It's a story worth hearing and worth listening to. So ladies, come along and bring a friend maybe with you. If you haven't come before, well, come on Thursday evening and you'll be more than welcome. The service is next door's day at 11 o'clock in the morning and 7 in the evening. And Andrew Daly will be preaching at both services. And uh, Florida will be singing at the evening service. There will be a members meeting on Wednesday, the 2nd of February. And uh, that's at the close of our church night. Those who are responsible for submitting reports for the annual general meeting, would you please get them to the secretary as soon as possible. As I intimated this morning, we mourn the passing of our dear sister May Elwood. We have expressed our sympathy uh, to Philip and to the family. Uh, in all probability, the funeral will be on Wednesday from here. We're not sure of the time, but when we get that information, we will relate it to you as best we can. I think these are all the necessary announcements, and we make them subject to the sovereign will of God. Our God is a great God. The psalmist says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. The hymn writer puts it like this, Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art. Let's stand and praise the Lord as we sing, O Lord my God. Thank you.
this evening that we can say with all sincerity how great thou art. We thank you, Lord, in these moments we have considered the greatness of creation. But, oh Lord, it pales in the insignificance when we see the greatness of your love. Your word tells us of this great love wherewith you have loved us, that even when we were dead in trespasses and in sin, you loved us. You sent the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Savior. And it's been so eloquently put this evening when, when I think that God is so not sparing. Send him to die. I scourge can take it in. And we realize, Lord, that tonight once more will exhaust the very words of the English language to try and express the greatness, the grandeur, the wonder of your love. But we ask our Father that this night you will help your servant as he seeks to uplift the Savior. That you'll give him liberty to proclaim the whole counsel of God with eloquence, with wonder. But, O oh Lord, in a way that exalts the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is worthy alone to receive that honor. Pray, Lord, that you'd open hearts in this meeting tonight if any know not the Savior. We thank you that this is still the day of grace. We thank you, Lord, that there is still opportunity to be found. That the Savior is still found knocking at the heart's door. We pray this night, Lord, that he will be allowed to enter in. We ask, O oh God, that for everywhere where the word of God is preached, we realize, Lord, we're conscious of where we are, that our our specific request is for this neighborhood, for this area, for this road. But, oh Lord, we pray that right across the world, as the word of God has gone forward this day, we pray that many would be swept into the kingdom of our God, added to the number of the redeemed. And, oh Lord, amongst their number, see of those who we love, those who we care for, those whom we pray for. Do this for your glory, we pray. We look to you tonight. Grant that our worship may be acceptable in your sight. Grant our Father that as we sing that your praises, Lord, it may ascend to heaven as a sweet savour. Grant, O oh Lord, that as we gather and read your word just now, that you'll give it a meaning, a sense, a power. Lord, that will touch every heart, that it will come with freshness as it's preached. And for all this, Lord, we would seek to give you the glory. They remember, Lord, those needs that we're aware of tonight. So many of our numbers shut in. And Lord, we pray publicly for them because, Lord, we dare not forget them. We thank you for those who have been so faithful in prayer down through the years who have remembered us. We remember them tonight. And as ever, Lord, we do pray, especially tenderly we ask for those who mourn that you'll show yourself to them to be the God of all comfort. Bless us tonight. Shut us in with yourself for these moments. And write your word upon our heart, we pray. We ask in our Saviour's name. Amen. Our scripture reading this evening is found in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 18. We'll be reading from the 21st verse.
have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But went and cast him into prison, that he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called them, said unto him, O thy wicked servant, I forgive thee all thy debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to his tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do all that want to you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. It's not possible always to invite a choir to come on a regular evening service. But because of modern technology, we're able tonight to listen to the church choir from Armagh Baptist Church. And when you look at the screen, in a few moments you will hear them singing a lovely piece entitled, We Will Remember. Let's remain seated and listen to this before we come to the Word of God.
the day you saved me, the day I heard you call out my name. You said you'd loved me and would never leave me. And I Spoil a soul or a life when there's a lack 
of mercy. And when we have a lack of mercy, then we are tempted to have an unforgiving spirit. Dr. Borum tells of an old man he visited during the latter part of the old man's life. He said he was a man who nobody liked. He was hard, moody, and mean. And had you met him on the street and spoke to him, he would have kept his eyes straight in front of him, drunk it sulkily and passed on. He never looked at anyone in the eye or in the face, spoke to no one, and made it difficult for anyone to speak to him. Dr. Borum says little children shunned him. Some said he was a hermit, others a miser. Some said he was a woman hater. Some said he was a fugitive from justice with some guilty secret. But Borum says in his writing, they were all wrong. He was a man with a grudge. Years before, in the old man's uh, youth, a companion had done him a grievous injury. And the response to this old man in his young days was, I remember that to my dying day. And he did. But when his dying day actually came, the old man realized that his harder bitterness and sorrow and darkened his whole life. He said, I have gone over it every day by myself, he moaned, and I have thought of it every night, he added brokenly. But I see that my bitterness has eaten out my soul, my hate has hurt no one but myself, and God knows that it has turned my life into hell. One writer says, the person who plans revenge may destroy others, but he will also destroy himself. Jesus Christ teaches us here that there is a blessing to be experienced in being merciful. What does it mean to be merciful? Well, it means identifying ourselves with others. It means trying to put ourselves in their shoes, trying to see things from their point of view. And I think if we're honest, we all need to learn this lesson. And if we did, it would be helpful to us in displaying the mercy that God is talking about here. Would there not be a greater kindness in our judgment? Would we not be less harsh, less critical, less fault-finding, and more understanding? Maybe those who offended us, hurt us, wronged us, are not as guilty as they first appeared. Maybe we're reading something into things which are of our own making and not factual. Maybe we do stop to hear the whole matter and formulate our opinions too quickly. Jesus exhorts us here to be merciful. Jesus tells us to be merciful and to show mercy. And to be mindful that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You see, our Lord perfectly demonstrated this balance, grace and truth. Truth by itself is cold and hard. We need to mix it with grace. We need to mix it with mercy. There might be a valid reason about which we know nothing. And so we need to be very careful not to jump to the wrong conclusions. And I don't I think we will stay greatly from the truth that we will be determined by the grace of God to go through this world with a heart that is full of mercy. Well, from a human standpoint, there is no reason to be merciful. If we identify ourselves with others, we will be more tolerant, more forgiving. Isn't it so easy to condemn? someone else's wrongdoing and at the same time condone evil and sin in our own hearts. Too often we can be wrapped up in ourselves and in our own grievances that we don't think about the other person except to condemn them. If we really identify ourselves with the need of others, we would be more forgiving, more tolerant, more helpful. There's mercy with the Lord. And we who have received mercy, we who have experienced mercy, are told to display that mercy. 
Is that not the emphasis of our Lord's teaching in the parable of the Good Samaritan? In that parable, is there not an outstanding illustration of mercy? The injured Jew had no claim upon the Samaritan. Indeed, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, and the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a very dangerous road. Muggings on that road were very common. One historian says the wise traveller would never travel alone if he can. To then he would cover the distance as quickly as he could. And that's what the priest and the Levite were doing. They're travelling alone and in a great hurry. They saw the injured man, they looked at him, and said, that's all. Maybe they offered a few uh, pious phrases, but there the man remained. They may have felt something, but the bottom line is this, they did nothing. The Samaritan, on the other hand, showed mercy. He was sorrowful, sorry for the victim. He went across to him, he dressed his wounds, he put him on his donkey, he took him to the inn, and he paid for his keep. That is mercy. That's how God dealt with you and me. That's how God displayed his mercy toward you and me. He found me bruised and dying. He poured in oil and wine. He whispered to assure me, I found thee, thou art mine. I never heard a sweeter voice. It made my aching heart rejoice. Oh, the love that sought me. Oh, the grace that bought me. Oh, the blood that brought me to the fold. When Jesus finished the story, he questioned the man who had questioned him and said, Which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? But the lawyer couldn't bring himself to say the Samaritan. What he said was this, the one who showed mercy. Mercy rewrote my life. And if you're a Christian like mercy, rewrote your life. Our merciful God got involved with us in the sending of his Son. Our merciful God got involved with us when he sent forth his Son to die on the cross, to bear our sin and shame. And in mercy, God has withheld from us what we do not deserve, what we do deserve. It is the very opposite of justice. The just one, the Lord Jesus gave himself for the unjust, you and me, the righteous, and took the place of the unrighteous. And in that transaction, the mercy of God was displayed. In the Bible, we have mercy explained. In the Bible, we have mercy experienced. In the Bible, we have mercy encouraged. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The consistent teaching in the New Testament is one of encouraging us to be merciful. And if you're a Christian tonight, if you're a child of God, if you've received the rich mercy of God, you have at least two powerful incentives to be merciful. And if we're not moved by either of them, then there's every reason to doubt the validity of our faith. The first incentive tells us to look back. To look back. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 4 and 32. He says, be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Just as God in Christ also forgave you. That's the backward look. He's taken them to Calvary. He's taken them to the cross. In Colossians 3 and 13 he says, If anyone has a complaint against another, and that can happen even in the best of lives, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must forgive. If we have received mercy, then we need to show mercy. That's the backward loop. You see, the argument, don't you? You've had mercy shown to you, therefore show mercy to others. You have been forgiven, then forgive. 
It's a powerful argument. I remember when we were on holiday at Bournemouth, there were other pastors there, and we had an unofficial arrangement that if you were free, we met on the east uh, coast, the beach there. And often we would have met up when the children were small. And, and sometimes they did misbehave themselves, even though they were pastors' children. And uh, sometimes they had to be reached for. And uh, part of their anatomy had to maybe feel part of your anatomy. And when that was happening, and Pastor Smith, the late Pastor Smith, was looking on, and you were maybe making an attempt to reach for your little one, you would have heard him say in the background, Mercy, mercy, mercy. There's mercy with the Lord. And many a child escaped because of that statement, there's mercy with the Lord. But aren't you grateful tonight? I hope you are. That there's mercy with the Lord. We see that illustration in Matthew 18. That's why I asked Clive to read from that passage of Scripture. It's a powerful argument in Matthew 18. The Lord Jesus puts it into a very telling story, which was the parable of the two debtors. The first debtor owed his master 10,000 talents, a vast sum of money, but he had nothing with which to pay. And so his master wanted uh, to throw him into the debtor's prison. The man begged for mercy. I'll pay you if you give me more time. And his master, out of kindness and pity, forgave him all his debt. It's unbelievable, isn't it, when you read on in the story? Jesus says, Then that same servant, with the burden of his debt lifted, sewed gloriously from his shoulders, came upon a fellow servant who owed him a hundred pence, but he demanded immediate payment. And although it was such a small sum of money, his fellow servant couldn't pay it, and he asked him for time and begged for mercy. But the man refused to listen to him and had his fellow servant thrown into debtor's prison. You may say, what an ungrateful man. What a terrible thing to do. But be careful not to condemn this man and condone the very thing in yourself. Has God forgiven you? Do you forgive others? God's mercy flows into this unmerciful world through the mercy of his people. And if there's a blockage somewhere in your life and mine, then the mercy stops flowing. The first incentive is to look back. The second incentive to be merciful encourages us to look forward. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. When Jesus gives us the family prayer, there was only one petition that he commented on. And there was the petition that read, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And if we pray that prayer with unforgiveness in our hearts, that's hypocrisy. And when Jesus got to the end of his prayer in Matthew 6 and 14, here's what he said. For if you forgive men their tres for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. In other words, if God's forgiveness has come to you, if God's forgiveness has come to me, and we're not showing it to others, then you have never really understood what God's forgiveness is all about. You've never really appreciated it. You've never really appropriated it. You've never really received it. One day John Wesley went to a man who was a civil servant to plead for one of his employees who was dismissed for some small offense. The man said to John Wesley, I never forgive. I never forget. And John Wesley looked him straight in the eyes and said, Then I hope, sir, that you will never sin. I hope, sir, that you will never sin. The Christian stands between mercy received and mercy still needed. And we shall need mercy till our dying day. That's why God has provided for all of us a throne of grace. 
And at that throne we receive mercy and grace to help in every time of need. And as we receive it, so we share it. As we receive it, so we express it. And we don't show it, how can we do it? If we need mercy ourselves, how then can we withhold it from others? You see the argument? It's a very strong one. The believing sinner has received mercy from the Lord. The believing sinner has experienced the grace of God in salvation. The believing sinner has been the recipient of such wonderful mercy from God. How then can he not but show mercy to others? Are we merciful when others fail us? Are we merciful when others let us down? Are we merciful when others offend us? When others are rude to us? Do we remember that we are but sinners saved by grace? Do we recognize that we are constantly in need of God's mercy? Years ago, in a small town, a merchant who owned a very busy shop had identical twin boys who were inseparable. Uh, they were so close, they even dressed alike. It was said that their extraordinary closeness was the reason they never married. When their father died, they took over the family business. Their relationship was considered by many as a model of creative collabor collaboration. Because he was busy, one of the burdens neglected, one of the brothers neglected to ring up a seal. Mm -hmm. And absent mindedly he left a dollar bill on the top of the cash register. When he went to the front of the store to wait for another customer. Remembering the dollar he returned to deposit only to find that the bill was gone. He asked his brother if he had seen it, but the brother said he hadn't. An hour later, he asked his brother again, but this time with an obvious note of suspicion. His brother became angry and defensive. And every time they tried to discuss the matter, the conflict grew worse, culminating in vicious charges and countercharges. The incredible outcome was a breakup of their partnership. The installation of a partition down the middle of the store with two competing businesses. And they continued for 20 years. It was an open, divisive sore which everybody in the community knew about. One day a car with an out-of-state license put up in front of the store. A well-dressed man entered one brother's shop and asked how long the store had been there. Learning he had been there 20 years, he said, then you are the one with whom I must settle an old score. He said, 20 years ago I came into this town and I hadn't eaten for three days. As I was walking down the alley behind her store, I looked in and saw a dollar bill on top of the cash register. He says, everyone else in the front of the store was not around. I have been raised in a Christian home and I never before in all my life had stolen anything, but that morning I was so hungry I gave in to the temptation. I slipped through the door and took that dollar bill. And that act has weighed heavily on my conscience ever since, and I finally decided that I would never be at peace until I came back and faced up to that old sin and made amends. He said, would you let me now replace that money and pay you whatever is appropriate for damages? And when the stranger finished his confession, he was amazed to see the old store owner shake his head and in deep sorrow and beginning to weep. And finally, the old man gained control and taking the gentleman by the arm, he asked him to go to the store next door and tell its owner the same story. And the stranger complied. 
Only this time the two old men who looked almost identical embraced each other and wept side by side. Isn't it so easy to get it wrong? Isn't it so easy to be characterized by the absence of mercy rather than the presence of mercy? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight declares that there's mercy. There's mercy with the Lord. No matter how long you've sinned, no matter how great your sin is, there's mercy with the Lord. Maybe the devil has said to you tonight, your sin is too great. There's mercy with the Lord. Maybe the devil has said to you tonight, you've sinned for too long. There's mercy with the Lord. Maybe the devil has said to you tonight, it's too late. Your day of opportunity is over. It's gone. The very fact that you're here tonight indicates that there's mercy with the Lord. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. And we who have received mercy, we who are the recipients of mercy from this God who is plenteous of mercy, are called to show mercy. And if there is a greater amount of mercy among the people of God, maybe there will be greater blessing in the service of God, in the work of God, and in the witness of God's people. Blessed, blessed, happy, content are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Father, in the quietness of these moments, <coughs> help us to reflect upon the things that we are gleaning from your word. We're so thankful tonight that you are God who is rich in mercy. We're so thankful tonight that mercy like grace is flowing like a river. Multitudes there have been supplied. None need perish. All may live for Christ has died. Lord, we pray that you'll forgive us if we have been guilty of not displaying the mercy of God in our life to the extent that we should. Help us, O oh God, to show our appreciation of the mercy that we have received in Jesus Christ by sharing that mercy with others. Lord, we pray that you will just write this word in all our hearts this evening. Help us not to apply it to someone else, but to allow the Holy Spirit to apply it to my life and to each individual life. We pray in Jesus' name and for Christ's sake. Amen. We're going to remain seated and we're going to listen to a rendering of a well-known hymn by the Gither Singers, Years I Spent in Vanity and Pride. Let's remain seated. And listen to this song before we close the meeting with the benediction. Thank you. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on
Jesus Christ, our Lord. 